Uh, why don't we uh, begin in prayer? Welcome to Sunday School this morning, where we're only covering one person, so we won't leave off the last two for the final seven minutes of class. Sorry about that. But there's a lot more you can read about Wycliffe and Huss if you go out on your own and do some study and be glad to share some notes with you. Um, but uh, I'm sorry about that, and uh, I really enjoyed talking about Peter Waldo, as you can, as you can tell. We're, today we're, we're jumping into... Um, Jumping into Martin Luther and the background of his life, passing the baton off to Pastor Tim for next week. So we got a part one and part two of Martin Luther today. But uh, I'd like to I'd like to pray. And I um, heard some encouraging words about the ladies, uh, the friendship luncheon yesterday. So really thankful that that our ladies were there and there were some visitors there who came and heard the gospel. Some ladies who uh, I believe uh, at least one who took a Bible home. Uh, one lady who is Romanian who talked to our own Miss Florence afterwards, so they had a good conversation in Romanian, which is beautiful, and uh, so we're glad about that. But uh, I'd like to pray, and then, and then we'll, we'll uh, jump in. Lord, thank you for a new day. Thank you, God, for um, being able to look back and see the way that um, those who have gone before us, especially a figure like Martin Luther, um, has done so much uh, and has been used by you and Father, we really are getting glimpses of your great mercy and grace and salvation. And we're thankful, Father, for those who have gone before us that teach us. Help us, Lord, to have this perspective, uh, to have a greater understanding and appreciation for, uh, for all that you have done, for names and dates and places and people that, that, um, that Lord, I, I pray would help us appreciate your work in history and time and space. God, we praise you and we thank you. Lord, thank you for the, the ladies who were a part of the uh, friendship luncheon yesterday. Lord, for the ladies who visited, who heard the gospel. Lord, thank you that the word of God was um, the good seed that was sown and we pray that hearts would receive it. They would bring forth fruit to your glory for their salvation. And I pray for the follow-up conversations that happened, for the, the, the word of God that was taken with them Lord, that you would use this in a great way uh, to bring salvation and to glorify yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, as we begin here, I ask if uh, Chris, if you could please read Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. So could you listen as Chris reads Romans 1, verses 16 and 17 for us? Go ahead. The righteousness of God is revealed in what? What does it say? The gospel reveals to us the righteousness of God. How? Dave, you just said this. From faith to faith. It's a key phrase. We're going to come back to this. But just wanted you to, to hear these words as we get started. And we're talking about Martin Luther. And um, Martin Luther, you can see the, the, the note here up on the screen. Um, the greatest revolution... In the, think about this statement. The greatest revolution in the history of the Christian church was launched on October 31st, 1517. That's quite a statement. The greatest revolution. Maybe you want to debate that. But you would no doubt have to say either the greatest or one of the greatest revolutions. And how could we say that? Well, I want to, um, I want to work our way through here. And I want us to just consider that Martin Luther on that very day that very day, October 31st, 1517, nailed his 95 theses on the, the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg. How many of you are familiar with the fact that Martin Luther nailed something on the door of some church, right? You know that. 95 theses on the, the castle door of Wittenberg's church, right? Or we used to say the church door of Wittenberg's castle church. He was, he was not a revolutionary. He was not a politician, uh, he was not some great organizer trying to get uh, something started here that, that uh, we'll talk more about. He was a monastic professor. He was a professor uh, in a recently founded, a relatively inconspicuous German university. He was a man of profound religious faith. He's one of the few individuals, here's another one of those statements, he's one of the few individuals of whom it could be said that the history of the world was altered by his work. Can you imagine that? The history of the world 
was altered by his work. Now, of course, we say all this knowing that this is all by the grace of God. This is all in God's providential wisdom bringing about what we call the Protestant Reformation. All right? So let me give you a little background, okay? Uh, And as I do that, I want to just show you a few works here. Um, And there's a bunch of them. I'm going to quote today from uh, R.C. Sproul's The Holiness of God. If you have not read this book, I want to encourage you to get a copy of The Holiness of God. He's got a chapter called The Insanity of Luther. And Luther uh, and, and, and Sproul will uh, quote Roland Baton, who wrote the work Here I Stand about Martin Luther. Um, I've already told you about Bruce Shelley. I'm going to quote, uh, quote Bruce Shelley, church history in plain language. Some of you are very, were very attracted to the in plain language part of the title of that book by Bruce Shelley. This one's not so much in plain language. This is Williston Walker's A History of of the Christian church. And I'm going to start out quoting Walker. And then, and then there's one where you just have about four to seven pages on different uh, leaders of the Christian church by Woodbridge. All right, we're going to quote Woodbridge. So just, just show you the sources that we're going to be quoting and some of them quoting at length. So don't mind me as I need my glasses, read some quotes, talk loudly, and take a sip of whatever Chris Tony's drinking over here. All right, <laughs> here, here we go. Um, let me give you some background here. We're talking about Martin Luther and these great statements about the greatest revolution in the history of the church and the history of the world altered by his work. What's the context? What was life like for, for, for Martin Luther and the people in his day? So here's the Germany that Martin Luther was, was born into. And William Winston, uh, Winston the author of uh, the uh, history of the Christian church that I just showed you, he writes this, Germany at the beginning of the 16th century was in many respects the most churchly, and use that word, of European lands. Uh, The authority of the Pope, papal authority, remained greater in Germany than any other leading country apart from what other country would it be? Apart from Italy. Lay piety and devotion, while often sometimes giving way to wild expressions or excesses, it still ran in the traditional channels. That is, people, they took pilgrimages and they, they conducted masses for the dead. They were very popular. The veneration of the saints, especially the Virgin Mary and of her mother, St. Anne, had increased dramatically. Collections of relics abounded, right? Collections of, of relics. Like this was something that actually the Apostle Paul had or Peter had or Jesus had, or, right? And the sale of indulgences multiplied. More on those later. Many new churches, chapels, and chantries were built. So that leads Walker to this conclusion. It cannot be said, therefore, that Germany, or any other European country for that matter, was in 1500 in a state of some sort of incipient revolution against the venerable rule of governance in the Roman church. In other words, you can't say that people are there just ready to revolt against the Roman church at this time. There was people that were taking part in, we could just say, lots of religious things underneath the auspices of the Roman Catholic Church. But, and here's the but... But he goes on to say this, beneath the surface, however, there were strong currents of discontent and disaffection. That kind of reminds me of how Amos the prophet says, he asked this question in Amos 3.3, can two walk together unless they be agreed? We often use that in premarital counseling. It's very helpful to be in agreement. You can look like you're in agreement, but not necessarily be in agreement. And what he's saying is, there looked to be a lot in agreement among the common people and the Roman Catholic Church, but there's something going on under the surface that maybe everything wasn't as great. And we already talked about some of those pre-reformers last week, right? Several of those. And so we know that there's a current there. The bane of the church, he says, was its fiscalism. What's fiscalism have to do with it? It has to do with money, how they spent their money, what they used their money for, how they raised money. The Renaissance papacy uh, lived beyond its means, was often on the edge of bankruptcy, not least because it required immense sums of money to maintain its political standing in Italy. So we have to keep sending them money, and so we have to keep raising money. So to meet expenses, what do they do? The the official court at the Vatican, governed by the Roman Catholic Church, called the Curia, they devised new and more expensive or oppressive taxes and fees and fines, and that bore heavily on the, the higher clergy. What did the higher clergy do with that? Well, they passed it down to who? The lower clergy. Who do the lower clergy pass that down to? Ultimately, the laity, right? This sounds like the story of Robin Hood somehow in some way, okay? They're passing this oppressive taxation down and down and down. So think about this. You've got people who are 
seemingly a kind of renewal in religious zeal, or at least not maybe a renewal, but, a, but a thoughts sort of being devoted to the Catholic Church, but they're also being oppressed by having to come up with money to support the church, coupled with the fact, if you remember last week, that people were starting to be very disillusioned by what they saw as immorality among those who were in leadership. So you couple the, the moral failings of those in various levels of church leadership, then this fiscalism led to this ominous development among an increasingly, here's what happened, an increasingly literate and educated laity. People, that is the common people, seem to be experiencing a bit of, a, of an awakening in the late Middle Ages. Not that they, were, they weren't growing more secular, they seemed to be actually growing more religious. They, they wanted not less religion, you could say they wanted better religion. They said, what does, what does the Bible have to say about this? Remember, much fewer number of people are able to read the Bible in that day. It's only offered to them in, in Latin, and people are not able to, to read that. And remember how we talked last week about some of these proto-reformers who were, were translating the Bible into the vulgar tongue or the, the vernacular of the day, and that was looked down upon by the church. But how important is us? Like right now, you can open up an app and read the Bible in 20 different languages and 20 different versions in English, right? Some of them you sure shouldn't read them in, but anyway, they're, they're, that's what we're saying. I'm not a KJV only person. That's, that wasn't a shot about that, right? So they wanted better religion. They wanted to know what was more biblical. They wanted their religion to conform itself, listen to this, to the pure apostolic church as pictured in the New Testament. And remember, they were saying things like, that ain't it. They pointed to Rome. They're like, this, this doesn't seem to be it. But there's still a strong tie to Rome. So Luther was born at a time when the Roman Catholic Church taught that one's eternal destiny would be determined by how effectively one had appropriated the church's sacramental graces, right? My eternal destiny is determined by how effectively I appropriate the church's sacramental graces, listen to this, in order to bring forward truly meritorious works. Since only a faith active in works of love could be a saving faith. I wonder if you caught in this the correlation between grace and faith in that statement. Between grace and and merit in that statement. How can it be? When you tell somebody about what grace is, you say, well, it's not through your merit, it's Christ's merits. And they're defining salvation as you working up more and more meritorious works so that your faith could earn you grace in order to be saved. You see the, you see the conflation of grace and works, of merit and faith, in a way that the Apostle Paul comes along and says, these two are, this is not the same. You get paid for what you work for. And faith uh, gives you something that you didn't earn. All right? But this is what Luther was born into. How do you think that would affect some of those sensitive consciences to some serious doubt? Right? If you're a person now who goes, and I really want to know what it means to please God, to walk right with God, you're having some, you're having some concerns about your own soul, and you hear, you hear this, you have to appropriate the church's graces in order to bring forth meritorious works so that you can have a faith that works uh, full of, of love. That way you know that you will be converted in the end. That's going to drive you to some serious despair, isn't it? Have I actually, here's the question, have I actually performed God-pleasing works? All right? right now, when you're witnessing someone, you, you probably ask that statement. I remember talking to a Muslim man about that who was very convinced that his salvation was about his works. And it's just a simple question. How do you know when you've done enough good works in order to be converted? And how do you know that you're not full of self-righteousness by saying, oh yeah, I've done all the works I need to be converted. Think, rich young ruler, all these things I've kept from my youth. Right? Have I done enough to be assured of divine acceptance? Now, on top of that, how frustrating and how hopeless would people feel if the answer to those questions were somehow tied up with money matters and political purposes? Have I done enough? And now the guy knocking on my door who's assuring me that I do enough, I'm giving money to, and I'm just living a simple life with my seven kids farming my little piece of ground trying to eke out an existence, and he's taking it, and eventually it's working its way back to Rome where they're living this lavish lifestyle. What do you think that's stirring up among the people? Some real discouragement and discontent. So, let's talk about Luther and his early life, all right? Let's jump into Martin Luther, his parents. That's the background. That's what he was born in. Let's talk about his parents and early education, and let's, let's move here. On November 10th, in 1483, Martin Luther was born. 
1483, give you a time frame. His father worked as a, a copper miner. His parents were simple. They were, they were pious people, just the conventional piety, that is, godliness of the day. There was no evidence that they were severe on their eight children. Some people look at the way Martin Luther lived afterwards and said, like, I think his parents contributed to that, right? But there was no, there was no evidence that they were um, that sort of severe with their eight children. Luther was second born among the eight kids not putting any sort of excessive religious demands on them. The patron saint of the family was St. Anne, which is interesting. We'll talk about that more. Luther's dad, he was of peasant origins. He was a very ambitious man. The, the tide sort of turned for their family when he, he moved to Mansfeld, and his family's quality of life was improved, really up to new heights, because Luther's father became the joint owner of six mining shafts and two smelting furnaces. Remember, he was a copper miner. And so now, instead of just working in the mines, he's an owner of, a co-owner of six mining shafts and some... Now, Luther would still call himself a son of a peasant right, later on, but he's clearly, in his life, took a, a turn for the better, financially or economically, we could say. Um, a little more from uh, Needham, Nick Needham, and, and we have mentioned him the past couple of weeks as, as one of our sources. He grew up in a... Uh, Luther grew up in a peasant society that the everyday reality of the supernatural was taken very, taken very seriously. Very seriously. What do I mean? Events that, that educated people today would just think of as natural in his day were routinely described or ascribed to some evil spirits or the work of the supernatural. Thunder and lightning, for example. All right? And again, we'll, we'll talk about that. After his education at the little school in Mansfeld, uh, Luther was sent at the age of 12 to a boarding school and from there off to another school. So let's talk about the town of Erfurt and the lightning strike. Remember we just talked about lightning? This is what happened with Luther. <clears throat> at 18 years of age, he went to the University of Erfurt in central Germany. He intended to become a lawyer. That was his father's wishes. He had desired to enter some sort of religious work, maybe the priesthood, but his dad was like, no, our business, our family business needs a lawyer, not a priest, not a monk. Well, he graduated from his school in 1505. He came in second. He was a very good student, second in his class of 17. He was a very good student. Um, he had wanted again, to, he wanted to enter into a monastery to serve God, but his dad said, no, not a good idea. Well, then a crisis happened. How many of you would say that prior to you, your conversion, you remember some crisis event that happened in your life? Did you have a crisis event? Something happened. And maybe it's a crisis like this, or maybe it's a, a, a crisis of thought, of mind, of your state, emotional state. But there was a couple of different crises in Luther's life that led to sort of an aha, not his conversion yet, his conversion's still down the line. But here's a couple things that happened. There was the death of a fellow student, a friend of his that died. And it caused Luther to say, what's going on here? What, what am I doing in the world? Some of us have that testimony. When I was... 16 years old, a friend of mine died, and I had this, what am I doing with my life? I was, a, I was a church kid, and I knew answers, I knew, you know, right and wrong, I knew that, but there was a real crisis moment where it just felt like God was going, putting his finger right here. Jeff, what, what, what's going on with your life? Are you, are you playing games with me? Are you being serious with me? But another crisis moment that happened around the same time was a, <laughs> was a lightning strike, a bolt of lightning from a storm. Luther was walking. He was, he was, he was between classes. He was, he was either on his way back to Erfurt or right outside of town. But a storm came up quick. A lightning bolt struck. And from that, Luther determined that he was, it was the first month of his legal studies. Like he graduated, he finished his years. He was going to go to two more years. Then he would be officially a lawyer. And so he was just barely into that education when after the death of his friend and after the lightning strike, he forsook his university life. He renounced the world and he joined the Augustinian order of friars in Erfurt. You think his dad was happy about that? When the lightning struck, he cried out, St. Anne, I will become a monk. So he had to keep good on his vow, right? And that was his father's patron saint. So it was like that. And his dad was not happy with him. Uh, of course, he was in shock. He was angry. But Luther was taken with these events. He was awakened to an overwhelming passion for religion and even really the salvation of his own soul. And in medieval Catholic Europe, you need to understand this, becoming a monk was the most popular way of increasing one's um, assurance of salvation. <laughs> you want your chance of salvation to be higher? 
become a monk or become a nun. So you can just get an idea of where he's at, right? So this is not only I really want to serve God, this is I hope if I do this I get in. It's conscience plaguing him. Let's keep going. Now we've got a, a, a transition to monastic life, right? So we've got his parents, the lightning strike, and now to, tra- to, uh, to monastic life. He's, he was recognized soon as an outstanding scholar and a great preacher. He was ordained to the priesthood in 1507. He became a junior lecturer the following year at the new University of Wittenberg, or Wittenberg. Founded in 1502 by Frederick the Wise of Saxony. I wonder if Frederick gave himself that name. Frederick the Wise of Saxony. Found, and, a, and a benefactor uh, to Martin Luther. Luther gave himself to the rigorous pursuit of the monastic life. Just think about his life. The pursuit of the monastic ideal. Strict discipline was maintained. He devoted himself to study, to prayer, and the use of the sacraments, especially the sacrament of penance, which meant examining himself and sorrowing for his sins and confessing his sins to a priest, fulfilling whatever satisfaction was impressed and imposed upon him. He punished himself with prolonged periods of fasting, uh, prayer, sleepless nights, flagellation. He's, He's whipping and beating, flogging himself in order to make some atonement for sins that was called upon him. He wearied the priest with his confessions. This is something that's known uh, about Martin Luther. He had a confessor. You live in the monastery, you have a confessor. You go in and you confess your sins. And just imagine how many terrible things would go on in a monastery. Forgive me, I ate an extra piece of stale bread today. I have sinned. I coveted that man's bread right there. You know, I know that sounds bizarre, doesn't it? Luther, it said, at times spent six hours confessing only to walk away, go down the hall, turn around and come back and say, I forgot some. And and the confessions were to hear, so the confessor say, here's what you do for your absolution. Here's how you find forgiveness for what you've done. Finally, one of his confessors was so exasperated that he told the young Luther, God is not angry with you. You are angry with God. Do you not know that God commands you to hope? More on this soon. Luther wrote this about his own experience. You'll like this. He said, I was a good monk. I I kept the rule of my order so strictly that I may say that if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was I. (laughs) Use that word monkery sometime this week. Use it. If you ever get to heaven by your monkery, if anybody ever got there, it was I, right? He says, all my brothers in the monastery knew me, who knew me will bear me out. If I had kept on any longer, I should have killed myself with vigils, prayers, reading, and other work. Listen, all these things that we just said he's doing, and he is a stranger to saving grace. Right? We're talking about an extremely religious man who's a stranger to saving grace. So let's talk a little bit more about monastic life and the righteousness of God. Because Luther's confession, excuse me, Luther's confessor was actually on to something. When he said... God is not angry with you. You are angry with God. He was on to something. Luther was, in fact, angry with the God who demanded a righteousness, a perfection that he could never give and who condemned him for not giving it. Now, let me ask you this. Does God demand a righteousness from us? What's the answer? Yes. Are we able to give it ourselves? No. Will we be condemned for not having it on the last day? Yes. Is that all of the gospel message? No. In fact, Chris just read for us the gospel summarized in Romans 1, 16 and 17. And we're going to get there. But so Luther knew something of the righteousness of God, but he only knew it as, I can't get this. And God is over me and he's angry with me and I am angry with him. <laughs> Here's a little helpful background for you about Luther's study of theology at Erfurt. It brought him under the influence of those who had gone before him. That often happens. You go to university and there's, a, there's a, a school of teaching that might permeate that university. It doesn't mean there's not diversity. You can go, at least at one point, you could go up to Princeton University and you go in the seminary there and you can find people, a couple professors who will say, yes, we believe that the Bible is inerrant. And you'll find several professors who make it their aim to say the Bible is not inerrant and they will undermine the core doctrines we would call the fundamentals of the faith. And they're co-faculty members at the same, on, on the same, at the same school. But here's, the, here's the, the, the belief that was sort of permeating where he was teaching. It, it, in that school, it came from William Ockham. Some of you have heard of Ockham. And, and also came from Gabriel Beale. And their background was a, was a neo-Pelagian or a semi-Pelagian emphasis. This is their emphasis on natural free will, effort, 
and merit obtaining, merit to do what? Obtain divine favor, right? Obtaining divine grace. And you know what that did for Luther? It made him despair even more, right? Of ever finding salvation that he seemed to hunger and thirst for. I became a monk and he enters a school and the kind of philosophy that's pervading the school here is, well, let's talk about Pelagianism. Pelagius denied original sin or inherited sin, which by the way is refuted very clearly in Romans chapter 5. We got Adam, from Adam came his sin, and all have sinned. It says that. Romans chapter 5 is very clear, among other places in the scripture, right? But Pelagius denied original sin, denied then that we inherited sin, and he emphasized the freedom of the human will as opposed to the sovereign grace of God. Guess who fought against Pelagius? Augustine, right? And Augustine, now, now we're talking about somewhere a thousand years before uh, before Luther, right? He fought against Pelagius and his doctrine. The Council of Carthage in 418 condemned Pelagius and his teaching, and he was excommunicated the same year. Well, semi-Pelagianism is the teaching that we're not so depraved. I mean, we are sinful, but we're not so depraved that we cannot cooperate with God's grace on our own. So see, there's a, there's a synergism happening here, not a monergism. And we want to uphold the fact that salvation is of the Lord, not of the Lord and me. It's of the Lord. So it's still a denial of total depravity, the, the radical sinfulness of humanity. And Nick Needham writes, although this young friar was very holy in the eyes of others, in his own guilt-wracked conscience, he could never find any assurance that he had made himself worthy enough to deserve God's mercy. God's righteousness haunted him. And you see then the school that he was into was saying, here's the obtaining of salvation and divine favor through your natural free will, through your meritorious works, right? Through your earning divine grace and favor. So again, what does that do to a young man who's trying legitimately to earn? And by the way, the church has now made up a whole system for how you can earn this favor. So now Martin Luther is an academic. He's a professor. He's got pastoral oversight. And he's got his own conscience. There's a lot of things Martin Luther's life, where he's weighing out what he sees and what he hears. Then enter Johannes von Staupitz. You've heard of this man, Staupitz? A huge impact on Martin Luther. He's the confessor that was listening to Martin Luther's confession. He's the one who said, you're, not, you're angry with God. He had a huge impact on Luther, he was, a, he was a spiritual guide. He was a professor of biblical studies at Wittenberg. He was a fervent disciple of Augustine and his theology of God's sovereign, unconditional grace. A theology of salvation that was opposed to much of what was taught by his predecessors. And he took uh, Luther, excuse me, under his wing. He was Luther's confessor. Again, he's the one who grew agitated for his excessive confession. Can you just imagine someone saying that? Quit confessing so much. Well, Luther knew that he couldn't earn God's favor. He knew he couldn't merit righteousness. It tormented him. Uh, Staupitz tried to lead the young friar to a sort of a self-abandoning trust in God's free and undeserved mercy, a mercy that was made visible and tangible in the wounds of the suffering Christ. Listen to what Luther testified of Staupitz. He said, he was my first father in this teaching. He gave birth to me in Christ. If Staupitz had not helped me, I would have been swallowed up in hell and left there. Just think about, we're, we're talking about Luther being the mover and shaker that he was, and he's saying this, if it wasn't for this man helping me, I would have never got here. Just think how important it is to have these conversations with people, helping them as they wrangle through the faith, as they're trying to figure out what does the Bible say and what does it mean by this? How important is that? Staupitz also encouraged Luther for a doctorate in theology. Go for it, he said. He recognized that he was brilliant, so Luther received his degree. He took over for Staupitz as professor of biblical studies at Wittenberg. And there, he lectured on books like the Psalms, and listen to this, and Romans, and Galatians, and Hebrews. Staupitz was like, I think the more he prepares to teach, the more he's going to learn himself. Isn't that true for all of us who ever have to teach, right? And boy, was he right. Another thing happened during this time was Luther's trip to Rome and his great disillusionment with, with Rome. What happened there? Staupitz thought it would be good. Send Luther to Rome for a visit. He sent him on some official business for the Augustinian order. <laughs> well, in fact, it proved to be profoundly disenchanting for Luther. His cynical attitude toward religion was only bolstered by what he saw there. What did he see? He saw the church's extravagance, corruption, 
their monopoly on the Bible. What does that mean? It was in Latin and few could read it. One of the things Martin Luther did was translate scripture into what? German. Because the common person needs to be able to read the Bible. But he saw a lack of interest in the plight of the poor. We'll see that in one of the theses. We're going to look at it, seven or eight of the theses that he wrote. In the veneration of elix, uh, yeah, relics, the selling of indulgences. He was later fond of repeating this proverb, if there is a hell, Rome is built over it. Wow. He called it a cesspit of sin. Every aspect of the divine was there to sell. Okay, picture what used to be our local Christian bookstores on steroids, right? It's like just you could buy everything, everything, except the Christian bookstore wasn't telling you you'll go to heaven if you buy this, right? At least I don't think they were. There's another thing that happened while he was there, and some of you are familiar with this. While Luther was there, he visited the Scala Sancta, the Holy Steps. Have you heard of the, the Holy Steps in Rome? They were believed to be brought back from the Holy Land, the actual steps um, that led up to the praetorium that Jesus would have climbed when he was on trial before Pontius Pilate. Marble steps that were supposedly brought to Rome, covered in wood, and Roman, I believe Catholics even still do this today, they make a pilgrimage there, and they climb up those steps, they say the Lord's Prayer on each of those steps, sometimes, as Luther would, even climb on their knees, and the pilgrim's reward, what's your reward for this climb? is fewer years in purgatory for each of those steps that you climb and say a prayer on. So what did Luther do? Now think about all that's going in his mind, but he still says, if this can help, my grandfather, his father's father who had died, he climbed on each of those steps and said the Lord's Prayer for his deceased grandfather to get him out of purgatory. And then when he got to the top of the steps, this is the thought that crossed his mind. I wonder if this did any good. You ever have that thought about religious stuff? He thought that. Imagine, I wonder if this did any good. I wonder. Who knows, he says, if this is actually true. <laughs> well, let's talk about his conversion. We don't know exactly. So all these events are leading up to a conversion experience. We don't know exactly when this took place. It, it appears the breakthrough occurred in the year 1518. R.C. Sproul wrote, writes about it in his book, I told you, The Holiness of God. He quotes Roland Baton, but this is what Sproul says. He says, then it happened. I want to read this to you. Luther's ultimate religious experience. There were no lightning bolts. That happened earlier in his life. It took place in quietness, in the solitude of his study. Luther's so-called tower experience changed the course of world history. It was an experience that involved a new understanding of God, a new understanding of his divine justice. That's what he was plagued with, right? Divine justice and righteousness. It was, a new, it was an understanding of how God can be merciful without compromising His justice. It was a new understanding of how a holy God expresses a holy love. And now here's Roland Baton quoting Martin Luther. <clears throat> Luther says, I greatly long to understand Paul's epistle to the Romans, and nothing stood in the way but that one expression, the justice of God. Because I took it to mean that justice whereby God is just and deals justly in punishing the unjust. And God is just, and He is just in punishing the unjust. My situation, he says, was that although an impeccable monk, remember all his monkery, I stood before God as a sinner, troubled in conscience, and I had no confidence that my merit would assuage Him. Therefore, I did not... Isn't that amazing how that's just the opposite of when you talk to people who don't have nearly as many works as Luther, but are very confident that they've done good enough. And why? They say, well, I've, I've never killed anyone. I've been a good neighbor, and therefore I'll go to heaven. Martin Luther is on the other end of that sort of spectrum going, I've done so much, and I don't think it's going to work. He was right. Therefore, I did not love a just and angry God, but rather hated and murmured against him. Stoppitz was right. Yet I clung to the dear Paul and had a great yearning to know what he meant. Night and day, here it comes. Night and day I pondered until I saw the connection between the justice of God and that statement that the just shall live by faith. Romans 1.17 that Chris read for us. The just shall live by faith. Then I grasped that the justice of God is that righteousness by which God through grace and sheer mercy, excuse me, then I grasped that the justice of God is that righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy, God justifies us through faith. His justice, His righteousness, is that He can look at someone based on the merits of Christ and say, you are forgiven. You are declared 
righteous. He said, thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through the open doors into paradise. The whole of Scripture took on a new meaning. And whereas before the justice of God had filled me with hate, now it became to me inexpressibly sweet in greater love. Isn't that beautiful? This passage of Paul, he says, became to me a gate of heaven. Romans 1, 16 and 17. Maybe one of the first verses that you memorized a long time ago, right? They am not ashamed of the gospel of God. It's the, it's the power of God and the salvation for everyone who believes, right? In it, this is the righteousness of God that's revealed. It's, the just shall live by faith. Is it a hidden? This faith, faith is so key here by God's righteousness is not coming to me through my works. I can't work enough. All that I have felt that I cannot do is actually in line with what the scriptures say. But I've been trying to do it and I've been wrong. And I've been angry with God, and yet He's shown great mercy in Christ. That's why I said earlier that God's righteousness revealed against sinners is only a part of the gospel, Romans 1.18. Then it goes on to talk about how God has made the way of righteousness imputed to sinners, and that's what Martin Luther found. Well, here we go. Um, his conversion, I think I hit my... The, the 95 Theses in their background, let's just talk about this. Um, the indulgences, right? We talked about indulgences. I said we'd come back to them. So here's what happened. The sale of indulgences was, was introduced during the Crusades. It remained a, a favored source of papal income. This is how we can get money. Indulgences are an exchange. The sinner does a merit work, and the church grants a favor and grants the sinner forgiveness. So what works does the sinner do? Well, frequently it was a, it was a contribution to a worthy cause or a pilgrimage to a shrine. So you give some money, you take a trip, and that's a work. That's a work that the sinner... So on what basis then does the church say, I forgive you? The church, as we said, remember this, the church draws from its, quote, treasury of merit. So the church is saying, we have a treasury of merits. We have been given this authority to say to you, on the basis of Christ's work and all the saints that have gone, all the merit that they've done, we can say to you, your sins are forgiven for the work that you've just done. You notice that, you see the twisting of the scriptures there? You and I can and should look at each other and say, on the basis of Christ's work, your sins are forgiven. We should say that to a repentant person who has faith in Christ, right? The Bible wants us to be assured of our salvation. God who saved you wants you to be assured of that based on the work that Christ has done, not the work that you've done. The giving and the, the saying and the repeating of Christ's promises to one another based on what he's done and what has he required of us, that we would repent and we would believe and be saved. But Luther was troubled over this because indulgences were often portrayed as sort of a magic by some zealous preachers, right? These preachers of indulgences. Regardless of the condition of the doer's soul, their good deed automatically got its reward. In other words, sorrow for sin was completely and conveniently overlooked by some of these zealous preachers because, well, they were receiving some benefit. They were getting some money. So enter this man, Johann Tetzel. And this is the time in the audience booze. Ooh, Tetzel, bad guy. What happened? In, well, here we go. In 1515, Pope Leo X, he authorized a special sale, uh, a, a set of indulgences in Germany. He says, you know, we're going to have a sale. We're going to sell indulgences and we're going to do this in Germany. He's doing it. Why? Well, because the Pope was raising money for St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Has anybody ever been to St. Peter's Basilica in Rome? It's supposed to be the place over which St. Peter is buried. Now, it's actually debatable whether Peter was ever in Rome, let alone buried there. But we're not going to get there right now, okay? They've got a basilica that we're going to raise money for. The construction had just begun earlier, and they're trying to raise money. How do we want to bring in cash to finance the building of St. Peter's? Well, you authorize the sale of these special indulgences. And so the Dominican friar who went to Germany would eventually find himself selling indulgences in and around Wittenberg, which is where Luther lived and taught and preached, was a man named Johann Tetzel. And Needham describes him like this. Listen to Tetzel. His indulgence preaching was an overpowering act of emotional manipulation. The Dominican promised his hearers that as soon as they bought one of his indulgences on behalf of a dead relative, God would instantly set the relative's poor suffering soul free from purgatory and admit it into the bliss of heaven. He even used a little rhyme. This is English. I want you to know that it also rhymes in German. I'm not going to say the German. As soon as the coin in the money box rings... The soul from purgatory springs, right? He got a little ditty even to go along with his raising money. As soon as the coin in the money box rings, the soul from purgatory springs. I texted him, I was like, 
what do you do about that in German? And they were like, oh, look, it rhymes in German too. Anyway, if a person bought an indulgence for himself, Tetzel claimed it would automatically wash away the foulest of sins. His publicity campaign was crude, Needham says, tasteless, vulgar, sensational, contrary even to the official theology of indulgences. We're taught that to be effective, they had to be accompanied by repentance. It's the official teaching. It should be noted that Martin Luther was not completely against indulgences, but this, he said, is terrible. He eventually was completely against indulgences. But at this point, he's like, that, this isn't right. So now let's talk about him nailing the theses. We're getting to our final point here, right? Look at this, and we still have five whole minutes. Nailing the theses and Luther's original intention. For, for Luther, Tetzel and his show, on behalf of the Roman Catholic Church, was really the straw that broke the camel's back. Luther's concerns were many. Personally, Luther knew this was not true, and he could never go along with it because of his own trained conscience. This can't be true, what this man's saying. Academically, he knew this wasn't biblical. This, this charade would never stand up against the scrutiny of Scripture. He couldn't do that. And furthermore, there was a pastoral concern. Luther had by now accumulated many pastoral responsibilities at Wittenberg. He preached every Sunday as pastor of Wittenberg's parish church, the, the Castle Church, it's called. He had some 11 convents that were under his supervision. That means he was responsible for the spiritual oversight of a lot of people. He was there, therefore, he was he's deeply horrified that people in his own parish would be and were buying Tetzel's indulgences thinking that salvation could be purchased for cash without any sign of repentance of their sins. You see the problem? Luther's conscience is struck deeply. So what did he do? He looked to start a revolution, right? No. He sought to overturn the Roman Catholic Church, right? No. He hoped to loose a storm of controversy that would grow steadily more furious and rip apart the very fabric of Western Europe. Isn't that what he set out to do? No. You know what he did? He simply announced, tomorrow there's going to be a public debate on the sale of indulgences. <gasps> right? He did a very common thing. He took a a, a sheet or sheets of paper and he went to the Wittenberg castle door, the church door, and he hung up on what was a bulletin board at that time. He nailed these 95 theses to the door saying, we're going to have a, bu a public debate about these things. He did not mean to unleash the storm that he did. He did something that we look at and we go like, Martin Luther's looking around going, here we go, wham, and he's nailing this, right? But it's almost like picture some signs you've seen on a telephone pole in a very prominent area where they're hanging up signs. It's not, it would be a little more, more radical than that. But it's a place where people would see public announcements. In light of the abuses of Tetzel and with his parish responsibilities in mind, not to mention his own conscience, Martin Luther arranged an academic disputation on the topic of indulgences and he nailed them, 95 of them, on the door of Wittenberg's Castle Church. It was not a dramatic gesture. It was the normal way of posting a public announcement. Little did he know the impact that that would have. What are some of those? Well, just some selections, right? Key statements from some of the 95 theses. Here we go. One, this is we're going to just finish reading some of these, and, and uh, Pastor Tim will, will unfold some more of this as he gets into the, right, you're going to do that, Tim? Thanks, bud. Um, here's some. Listen, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ says, repent ye, he means that the entire life of the faithful should be a repentance. That's the first one. What is he getting at there? The entire life should be a repentance. What does he mean by that? What's that? Putting behind your sinful ways. Why is it that he says the entire life of the faithful? It's not boiled down to what? Yeah, remember when I bought that relic? Remember when I, when I climbed the Scala Santa? Remember when I did, these, remember when I did this thing? Remember this guy, this guy Tetzel, he promised me a sale of, uh, if I do this. In fact, there was one funny story from Tetzel that some guy came up to him and said, if I buy this, will forgive any sin? Yeah. Anything, no matter what. Past, present, future. Yeah. The guy purchased it, and when Tetzel's on his way out of town, this guy and some people jumped him, beat him, pummeled him, and then left his little indulgence on his chest as he walked away. I must be forgiven of this. You see how ridiculous that is? And you're kind of rooting for the guy because of how bad te off Tetzel was, Right? Martin Luther's saying something to us. If there's no repentance right now, there's, there's no life of God in the soul of man. Right? Interesting, first one. This statement cannot be understood of the sacrament of penance, of confession and satisfaction, which is administered, administered by the priesthood. You see that? The life of repentance. 
Those things flow together. It can't be understood by what he had been taught. Um, he says, they preach human folly who pretend that as soon as money in the, ho- the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. He says that whole teaching is human folly. In other words, it's not bound up in the scriptures. It's not the mandate to preach the gospel in all the world that's given in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission. This is not that. Those who suppose that on account of their letters of indulgence, they are sure of salvation, will be eternally damned, notice this, along with their teachers. He took James' word seriously. Those, woe to those who teach these things. Right? So your letters, this is not what salvation is. Every Christian who truly repents has plenary, that is full forgiveness, both of punishment and guilt bestowed on him, even without letters of indulgence. This is so key. Do you see now how this is like, he's reading the scripture saying, it can't be what this guy Tetzel's doing, which also means it can't be the part of the, the teaching of the official Roman Catholic Church. Who's he going to get in trouble with soon? Well, it's not just Tetzel. This is going to make its way up, right? He's going to offend a lot of people, he's saying. And what he's saying, you and I, by the way, we take this for granted to be biblical truth because we have the Bible and a lot of what we have and what we know, we're standing on the shoulders of someone who's gone before us, namely Luther whom God raised up, right? Every true Christian, whether living or dead, has a share in all the benefits of Christ and the church, for God has granted him these even without letters of indulgence. He's doing, he's saying, this is a huge, Christ is the head of the church. And what Christ has done gives the benefits to the church, to those who are redeemed. That's what he's saying here. Even without letter, he has to add that because the common thought is, I need a letter of indulgence in order to have it. He says, no, you need Christ. You, you see why all the solas are going to come into play here when we talk about the Reformation doctrines? Christ alone is the head of the church. And therefore, his word alone is our authority. Let me not take more from other people's talks. Christians should uh, be taught that whoever sees a person in need, and instead of helping him, uses his money for an indulgence, obtains not an indulgence of the Pope, but the displeasure of God. Here's someone in need. I've got something to give to them now. Let me go over here and buy myself a a ticket out of purgatory. He says, that's not scripture. And instead you get the displeasure of God, not an indulgence of the Pope. Christians should be taught that the Pope ought and would give his own substance to the poor from whom certain preachers of indulgences extract money, even if he had to sell St. Peter's Cathedral to do it. Now this is either like, ask the Pope, will he do that? Or he's still a bit in favor with the Pope. I think by this time, he's still a little bit in favor of the Pope. What do you think? He's still saying, I think the Pope would do this, not what these, these, uh, these, tra- these, these peddlers are doing with indulgences. It's going to get to be where he's going to say, like, no, the Pope himself would watch this poor person go and live in his lavish place in Rome. He says it should be taught that we should be helping those who are in need. This shameless preaching of pardons makes it hard even for learned men to defend the Pope's honor against calumny or to answer the indubitably shrewd questions of the laity. He's saying, when people in my parish church are asking me about these things, how am I going to defend the Pope? How am I going to say, well, look, it's okay. Like, how am I going to defend this work? It's, they're they're increasingly shrewd. I mean, they're thinking through this. People are asking good questions, he's saying, and I don't have answers. Hence, the public debate. What good are these things, right? That's number 81. And number 82, for example, why does the Pope empty purgatory? Why does the Pope, why does not the Pope empty purgatory for the sake of holy love? For after all, he does release countless souls for the sake of sordid money contributed for the building of a cathedral. You're going to let people go for money they gave to build this lavish cathedral, but you're not going to do it out of love for those who are in need, right? That's the kind of thing like, man, if if you can do all these things, then, then help all these people. If you've got this power, this authority... You got this gift of healing, heal all the, go to the hospital and heal all these people who are sick. If you can pronounce forgiveness of sins, why only do it for people who are giving you money? That don't sound good, does it? In the vernacular. To suppress these very telling arguments of the laity by force, instead of answering them with adequate reasons, adequate reasons, would be to expose the church and the Pope to the ridicule of their enemies and to render Christians unhappy. The end. Nope. We should admonish Christians to follow Christ, their head through punishment, death, and hell. That means don't follow anybody else as head. And so let them trust, set their trust on entering heaven through many tribulations rather than false security 
And here's what Tetzel said after all those these He fired back with his own, including this. Christians should be taught that the Pope, by authority of his jurisdiction, is superior to the entire Catholic Church and its councils, and that they should humbly obey his statutes. So as Luther is pointing everyone to, well, I don't think this makes sense biblically as revealed in the Word of God. Here's his arguments behind his arguments as the authority of Scripture. Tetzel comes right back to the authority of the Pope and the church. That's where we will end today, and we will continue with Martin Luther, part two, next week. Thank you so much for your attention. It's hard to know what to take out and what to put in. Yeah. You're just barely scratching the surface. Oh, yeah. Just barely. Yeah, and it's ten of. <laughs>